and how many boosters is one good? Thank you very much, Isabella, and a very good evening to you, Uganda. Thanks a lot for joining us. An honor to have you with us tonight as we have a very important discussion on the status of COVID-19 vaccination across the country. I want to say a special welcome to all our viewers across different platforms across the country, of course, right here on NBS TV. Also saying a very good evening to our viewers on UBC TV, on Urban TV, and Baba TV in Jinja. A good evening to you, and thank you for joining us. As we have a powerful discussion this evening, COVID-19, it's never left, has it? It's been with us. And yet, only 51% of the population above 18 have so far been vaccinated. This is not good because, as we know, we still have surging cases. We've also got um, increased transmission. Could we be on the verge of a fourth wave? Well, we hope not, and this is why we want to have a very candid discussion. And together with the Ministry of Health and the World Health Organization, we put together a panel of experts who are well conversant with the science of vaccines and anything to do with disease prevention and control. And tonight, they will be here to answer any questions you might have as to why you should pay attention to making sure that you understand that COVID-19 vaccination protects you and your child. And we're saying, say yes to vaccination. You can follow the discussion on Twitter. We have some very special hashtags, COVID vaccination UG and hashtag vaccines work. Any questions you might have, any suggestions you want to make, we have the experts to answer those for you. We have a lot of information, a lot of which is false, a lot of which is not too clear, but today all of that gets answered. Our panel discussion starts right now, and I'm going to hand over to my lovely, beautiful friend and colleague, Mildred Tohaise, to get us into that discussion as we encourage you, of course, to remember that vaccines work. Mildred. Thank you very much, uh, Ben Mwine, for that introduction. Uh, I almost looked around to look for who the person you're introducing is. But I know when we talk about COVID vaccination and this such kind of town hall, most of the people online were asking, are they going to announce another lockdown? No, please, we shouldn't be thinking in the negative all the time. The reality is, like Ben says, um, COVID has never gone. I've, I've met so many people who say we are in the post-COVID era. No, I always love to remind you that we are in the post lockdown era, but not post-COVID, because COVID is definitely still here with us. There have been lots of information on social media going on, not any information that can be confirmed scientifically or otherwise, but it's been spreading and some people are actually taking it as the gospel truth. Now, those are some of the statements that we want to demystify. Uh, just recently also, the cabinet agreed to vaccination of children, and there's been a lot of discussion about some of you saying it's forceful. Some of you saying government just wants to rip off a COVID kind of discussion and, and whatever came through. But all that is going to be answered. The scientists are here, the medics are here, and we do also have the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health. But I want to introduce to you our panel. It's a huge panel, and I love the composition this time. It's more women than the men. I just want to stick that in. It's only one man on the panel. But let's start off by introducing to you who our panelists are going to be. Number one is, just take a look at this. Immunization vaccine and development, National Professor Officer, Routine Immunization, World Health Organization, Uganda Office. She is a Ugandan medical doctor public health specialist with a master's degree from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She has over 10 years of experience in the field of vaccinology. Several publications have been made currently working with World Health Organization Uganda as a national professional officer for routine immunization and new vaccine introductions. She is also the team lead for immunization vaccine and development team. She is the World Health Organization liaison representative of the Uganda National Immunization Technical Advisory Group. She has a vast experience in polio eradication initiative activities, new vaccination introduction including Ebola vaccine and COVID-19 vaccine among others. Her main role is to provide technical support to the Ministry of Health through the immunization program. Annette provides management, supervision and coordination within the World Health Organization country office to the immunization vaccine department unit, including external counterparts from the unit at the inter-country support team regional office for Africa and headquarters.
again, Dr. Annette Chisache. Feel free to say hello to our viewers, and they just can't wait to fire some questions. <laughs> <laughs> hello, everyone, and I'm glad to be part of this uh, good course. And uh, what I want to mention, we have good news for all the viewers this evening. Ooh, Thank you. That's already encouraging. We have a promise of good news. Mm. Next on our panel is... Chitaka is a senior lecturer for pediatrics and child health at Makerere University's College of Health Sciences. She obtained a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery from Makerere University in 1995. Her Master's of Pediatrics and Child Health in July 2012. She has conducted research among youths with HIV while she was at the Infectious Diseases Institute as a Gilead Fellow and Research Scholar from 2003 to 2011. She received her PhD from the School of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. She provides clinical treatment to HIV-infected children and adolescents, the majority of whom are prenatally infected. And this is involved in fundamental research in a number of pediatric infectious diseases. She is the founder and director of the Makere University College of Sciences Adolescent Health Training Program, as well as the Uganda Society of Adolescent Health. Dr. Chitaka is a committed member of the African Pediatric Society of Infectious Diseases. Definitely not a new face. Many of you have probably disturbed her with a phone call or a message about your children. Dr. Sabrina, it's a pleasure having you say hello to our viewers. Hi, viewers. And some of the questions coming in to me are, should I take my child for vaccination? Mm. Please stay there. We are going to let you know exactly why you should take your baby or your child for vaccination. Exactly, because many will be asking what age ranges are we looking at? You said earlier on the kids have better immunity. All those questions are going to be answered. Let's introduce to you our next panelist. Take a look. Onyeze holds a bachelor's in medicine and surgery, master's of public health and a PhD. Dr. Wanyenze is the dean of the School of Public Health and a professor in the Department of Disease Control and Environmental Health at Makerere University. Dr. Wanyenze has a vast experience in public health. Well, that panelist belongs to a committee that uh, some Ugandans dreaded back in the day when we were in lockdown, where they kept saying, please advise the president to open up. I don't know what advice this time is coming through, but Professor Wanyeze, say hello to our viewers. Thank you, Mildred. Good evening, viewers. I'm glad to be part of this discussion, and please stay there with us. We are happy to answer all your questions tonight. Thank All you. right. Our panel is not yet entirely complete. Let's let you know who our next panelist is. Take a look. Mokalebu is the director of Uganda Virus Research Institute.
and definitely we'll be asking about some research about some of the statements that have come through but professor it's a pleasure having you you can say hello to the viewers hello viewers it's a pleasure to be here and i look forward to the discussions i can't wait as well for the questions to be answered and last but not least on our panel is dr diana atwine And definitely, if there is any passion who, I mean a person who exhibited passion for the kind of um, a job that they do at the time when everyone feared to come out and speak out candidly about what was happening in the country that was, and is still, Dr. Diana Twine. A very good evening to you. Say hello to our viewers as well. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Please stay tuned for all the questions to be answered. Thank you very much. And of course, the questions definitely start at this particular point in time. But using the hashtag uh, vaccination UG and uh, also hashtag vaccines work, we will be able to take in any of your questions as they do come through. And uh, my colleague Ben Mwine will also be handling any questions that will be coming in from the public, part of the members who are part with us here. I know many of you are following up from TV. We have a few who are following with us here uh, live at the next conference center next media park plot 13 Nagoro summit view and we'll be taking in all those questions make sure that they continue streaming in Bukeda television baba television as well as urban tv thank you so much for as well joining us in this particular discussion but of course i would like to start off with dr twine um when someone gets to see us seated like this, talking about COVID and vaccination, their hearts are literally pumping at the fastest rate. Some are expecting some announcements that they're not sure about, but what's the current status in the country uh, with regard to COVID? Because some still think we are post COVID or COVID is done since we entirely now have, uh, we had the full reopening of the economy earlier on in January this year. Uh, it, it is true that many people think that uh, COVID has gone. COVID is still with us. COVID comes in waves. As you know, that we, in the last two years, we got three waves. But now we still have many cases in the country. And therefore, we, we don't want uh, people to put down the, the guards. They need to know that the, vac the vaccine is the only answer. Mm. Uh, COVID is going to be here with us. It, will, it, is, it has come like influenza and other diseases that, that, that come. But what we know and what is the answer for now is to make sure that we are protected through vaccination. Okay. Any more changes that could be coming through? Because we've so far seen some other countries that have already started announcing once again, um, for example, mandatory wearing of masks in public and, and all the other SOPs that we used earlier on. It is, it is very important that we maintain the SOPs, um, especially the, the ones that we are very sure that protect, like putting on masks, uh, sanitizing, and also um, avoiding um, the crowd, especially when we have high numbers. When the country is going through a wave, you know that there's a higher chance that you'll meet someone who is, who is, who is sick. So mm -hmm. the best is to, to prevent um, through SOPs, but also to make sure that um, we are covered through 
uh, vaccination. Okay. Just before we go to any of the other panelists, uh, you talked about vaccination, and, and definitely I agree, vaccines work. I have taken my jabs and my booster, and if there is any other chance to take another booster, it is okay. It is better to save my life than, you know, listen to all the hoax messages that are coming through. But, but Dr. Atwine, where is our stand? Where are we currently with regard to the numbers on vaccination in the country? Because I know that is part of what we hinged on to be able to reopen the country, even the schools themselves where we ask the teachers to be vaccinated and all the other essential staff. Do we have those numbers at hand? Are we doing good? Um, at the beginning, you know that we targeted to cover 22 um, million mm. and these were the age of 18 uh, upwards. But then later, we, we had to revise our statistics because we also wanted to include the children uh, from 12 and uh, up to 17 or up to 18. And so that number increased. But I, as we stand now, uh, for, the, for those that have received the first dose, we are talking about about 70 percent. Mm. Uh, those that have received full vaccination, we're talking about between 55 to 60 percent. Um, so we, we, we want to say that we have not reached 100 percent, and that's why we, we are here. That's why we, we, we want to rally everyone who has not been vaccinated to get vaccinated, but also those that have not completed the second dose, because there is benefit to complete that dose, but also to, to, to get jabbed. Okay. So we, we haven't reached 100 percent of our targeted population, mm. and, and, and therefore... This, that's the reason we must ensure that we observe SOPs, but also make sure that we encourage people to go and get vaccinated. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atwine. Professor Kalebu, um, COVID-19 brought the world to a standstill, never unprecedented that we even see the aviation industry come to a halt and everyone is under lockdown and we're just okay with it because everyone believed that that is where we needed to be. But we've known that over a period of time, vaccine manufacturing or development takes quite a long time period. And yet for COVID-19, just months after, we saw a vaccine come out. And, 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 and one would ask, how effective is this rushed vaccine? And I would quote, rushed vaccine. That's a very interesting question. And in fact, it one of, it's one of the causes of the hesitancy. Mm. People question, how could you, we've been telling people, vaccines take 10 years, 15 years, mm -hmm. but you make a vaccine in one year, I think it was a surprise. It was a surprise to many, but even scientists, it was really a triumph for science. But there are a number of reasons for this success. Mm. I think the technology that was used, we need to know, was not new technology in most cases. It's technology that had been used, or platforms that had been used for other diseases, HIV, they have tried it in malaria, TB. So they used that really, the new technology, to advance the COVID vaccine very quickly. Okay. But there was also a lot of working together, partnerships. You remember Operation Warp Speed, bringing together public, private, everyone coming together. For the Moderna vaccine, for instance, one of my colleagues who was working in Vaccine Research Center was one of those who designed it. Mm. He had been working on HIV for a long time to try to design the HIV vaccine. It was complicated. But he was able to use that technology, provide it to Moderna, and they had a vaccine. So that was very quick, working together. The investments, in, eight, in 11 months, they invested 85 billion US dollars. Wow. And for HIV in 20 years, they had <coughs> invested 15 billion. So you can see such a difference. Yeah. 85 billion US dollars in just 18 months. But also, the uh, platforms or the systems that were used for other diseases, very quick to conduct vaccine trials, using the systems, the platforms for HIV, those who have been working in HIV vaccine, H uh, HIV, uh, HVTN, HPTN, all those were used, that mm. helps to accelerate. Mm. Then they also did parallel studies, very quickly, very quickly, you are in the lab, you go into the, the animals, 
phase one, as you are finishing phase one, the results are appearing promising, you go to phase two, phase three. Very quickly, not staggering as we have done for other diseases. But I also want to tell you that <clears throat> people have been asking me, but how come for HIV it has taken a long time? Mm -hmm. The viruses are also different. We are dealing with different viruses. If you get COVID, m most of you recover. People recover. Yeah. In fact, many people remain asymptomatic, but they have been infected. The immune system can work on the virus. Mm. So you use that to develop a vaccine. You use what nature, what God has, uh, God has made to develop a vaccine. But for HIV, nobody recovers. We don't understand how HIV is protected. TB is another complicated one, yeah. many other diseases. So also the viruses were different. It was a little bit easier for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 than for some of the other complicated viruses. Okay. So that one also helped. So there were a number of reasons why. But also during trials, COVID when it comes, many people get infected. And you want that if you want to do what we call efficacy trials. You want many endpoints, many people to get infected to see whether the vaccine works. Very quickly, you can evaluate your vaccine. And like other diseases like TB, HIV, which takes longer, getting these events takes, uh, takes longer. So there were a number of those issues. But indeed, it was very fast. But mm -hmm. I can't, I want to assure everyone that it went through the right processes okay. for them lab, to the animals, phase one, up to the third phase. One out there is still, the, the doubting Thomases are still saying, for example, um, reads indicate that in 2015, there was a World Health Organization world, um, white paper, which indicated that the next epidemic would be coming through, and the virologists were quick to predict that it would be of a viral origin, right? And, and, and one would ask then, if we knew, the Baganda have a saying, so if we knew there is something that was coming, why did we panic? Why did we go on a standstill and yet this was actually something that was predicted. In fact, because of that prediction, it's one of the reasons that we were able to do better with this SARS-CoV-2. If we're not prepared, including in our country here, mm. yeah, the public emergency operating center, all that we have done, the ministry to prepare for emergencies was very helpful in addressing this. If that wasn't there, it would have been worse. So indeed, you're right. The scientists and the world has been on the alert that the next pandemic will be a virus, but we need to be prepared. And indeed, that is one of the reasons. You remember when we had Ebola in West, Nile, in, in West Africa. Yeah. Again, different organizations came together to create, for instance, what they call CEPI, uh, that is making vaccines. Every company, public, private, even this time for Ebola, such organizations like CEPI were very, very helpful in really funding, bringing ideas together to really address COVID. So indeed, our preparedness, our predictions did help to address COVID. Okay, Professor Roda, um, Dr. Kalebo has just talked about um, the vaccines and, and, and that we had existing technology and that was great that it came through quite quicker because we don't know where we would be today. But, but one then would ask, um, I, am, I was vaccinated against polio. I didn't get it against measles. The six killer diseases, now I don't know how many they are. I didn't get them. I am vaccinated against COVID and I still get it. So one would ask, is it effective or is it better that I will contract COVID, get my natural immunity and leave this whole idea of vaccination? Uh, thank you, uh, Mildred. And another very important question. So... Um, so when we get the vaccination uh, against uh, pol uh, rather uh, COVID, um, we we do help our body uh, to build immunity, uh, okay. as do, as uh, Professor Ponciano has said, and. Uh, or call it uh, proteins or whatever, but it's a protective mechanism of the body that is accelerated by the vaccine. Mm. And it works in two ways. It could stop the infection, uh, so you don't get infected with uh, COVID, but it's even more effective in terms of moderating the disease. So you might get infected, but then you don't get very severe forms of disease. It could just be very mild and you're off to work um, and, and, and healthy in a few days. On the other hand, if you don't have the, that protection at all, then you could end up getting very severe disease and even 
die. So, so it does reduce the chances of infection, but especially does reduce um, the, the severity of the disease and protects okay. us. So in that sense, it actually does um, uh, work well. It is effective and we should actually use it. The infection, like you said, uh, can also you know, help uh, to, to develop immunity, but it might not be as efficient uh, uh, as it were, uh, because we, we, we know, yes, it can protect, but at the same time, you're also risking getting the complications of the disease, uh, which are a lot more severe uh, than the vaccine. Uh, so, so you choose a more complicated route of getting your immunity when you could actually do it in a better way by using a vaccine which has been tested, whose, whose dose we know, whose frequency we know, okay. and, uh, and whose side effects we also know are really much, much more mild than um, you would from natural uh, infection. But, but, but doctor, you've talked about the efficacy, you've talked about it being effective, well and good. Then my, my village homie in Masindi is there thinking, okay, it is effective, thank you for preaching the gospel, then why are you asking me to do a booster just about six months after? So, uh, so vaccines are different. There are those vaccines you'll take and you don't have to keep you know, uh, uh, repeating all the time mm. uh, to be able to maintain a sufficient level of immunity to protect you all through. But there are those also we know where the immunity wanes off after some time. We know that that happens for the influenza viruses, for example. So okay. you take it, but after about 12 months, your, you know, the, your immunity is coming down and then you need a booster to help reactivate your body so that that protection is maintained. So as it were, we are seeing now that for COVID, uh, uh, we, we are perhaps going the same pattern as it is with the influenza. Of course, there are more studies that are going on, but right now it's very clear that the immunity does come down mm -hmm. and we need that booster to be able to keep uh, ourselves uh, protected. How many we will need eventually is still an area that, that we are still studying as the vaccine is rolled out in the uh, communities and we continue to study and, and, and we'll certainly be able to uh, share that information as well when it becomes available. All right, something burning I know out of someone there who says, huh, are we going to boost until God comes back? But that's a discussion that we'll be getting into just in a bit much later on. Dr. Sabrina, the mothers out there are already scared. The parents, not only the mothers, but of course the mothers got affected the, the most. When cabinet came out and agreed that there is going to be vaccination of children, and then there are reports of forceful vaccination. You know, our schools, they will say, I mean, you get vaccinated or you do not bring your child to school. Why are we having this conversation when earlier on the discussion was, all oh, the children have better immunity, you know, than us, the adults? Uh, thank you, Mildred. And that's also a very interesting question. The truth is, government cannot forcefully immunize any child. That okay. is not true. We recently had a statement from the Minister of Health who reaffirmed and said, government cannot forcefully vaccinate a child. Okay. If, you know, as adults, when we were first vaccinated in <clears throat> March of 2021, yes. we consented. And so how would anyone think that government will go and start vaccinating? As pediatricians would be the first ones to riot, wouldn't we? <laughs> you would, we would. No one is going to vaccinate a child by force. But the matter, the, the crux of the matter is children also need vaccinations. Children are the majority in our country. 55% yeah. of our population is less than 18 years. Yeah. And so for me, the fear is if the child is not vaccinated, like you heard Professor Roda saying, we don't know what kind of COVID infection they are going to get. And so there's always that fear. When we learned that Pfizer vaccine was safe, it's being given to American children. Okay. We were waiting and waiting for when Ugandan children would also get the benefit of that vaccine. Long COVID is real. And when you're kissed by COVID, we don't know how you're going to respond. Yeah. We don't know if it's going to be serious or if it's going to be disastrous, we do not know. So vaccinating a child is actually helpful. So parents are going to be given the liberty to peacefully 
take their children for vaccination. I am one of those 300,000 parents who have already got our children vaccinated. Okay, but, but Dr. Sabrina, the mm -hmm. first discussion in the beginning was that the children actually have better immunity, mm -hmm. you know, to, to fight off the COVID mm -hmm. um, without getting vaccinated. And also when we talk about what, what has changed, that's number one. So, and and, and mm -hmm. secondly also, when we talk about force, it is not like someone is going to come and get the jab to you know, like how they vaccinate. It could be cows. literal <laughs> force. Like the school says, you either vaccinate or don't bring your child. Actually, the truth is, if in, in some places that can happen, mm. but not here. There's negotiation, there's, there's understanding. And what has changed is the fact that children are actually becoming sick. There's data to show that, you know, 100 children who are admitted and critically ill, 10 of those children died. Mm. And all over the world we know that some children are actually dying from COVID-19 infection. Okay. So, as the world revolves, as this unprecedented new virus changes and keeps changing, and it started with the alpha variant, mm. and now as Professor Kalebo will tell you, we have the Omicron variant, and it's not the B1 1.2, it's now the B1 1.5. And who knows if it's going to become B1.1.x? 1. 1. We do not know. So as things keep changing, we wouldn't like to leave the children behind. Okay. It reminds me of those days when HIV was rife and parents were the ones rushing to treat themselves for HIV. Yeah. And the poor children were being left behind and they were dying. So in terms of equity and in terms of equality in healthcare provision, we think that children also need the benefit of the doubt to get the vaccine. All right, thank you. Doctor, I'll be coming back to you. Let me go to Dr. Annette. Uh, Dr. Sabrina, for example, pointed out Pfizer vaccine, safe and has been used on children in America. And we know we have Moderna, you have Pfizer, you have AstraZeneca, you have Johnson & Johnson. It, 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 it is a cocktail of these vaccines. And one is asking, number one, are they all safe? Do they work the same way? What, what's with this differentiation amongst the vaccines? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, that was a question asked in March 2021 mm. when we introduced the vaccine in Uganda. Are these vaccines safe? And as already mentioned by Professor, people are, are raising questions. The rush. Are we sure we're going to be safe? Now, let me first give a quick background vaccines are drugs okay okay now there's no drug which is 100 percent safe so even the vaccines are you can not... say that again doctor and we get scared the morning <laughs> no, no 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 i'm not scaring there's no drug that is 100 percent safe okay even for the vaccines hmm. let me give a quick example during the covid the second wave hmm. people took a lot of vitamin c yes and they developed side effects and it's a drug, it's a very simple drug, by the way, yeah. vitamin C. So even the vaccines are not entirely 100% safe. But there are side effects that were detected during the phases of the clinical trial, as explained by Professor Kaleb. And those are mild symptoms. And what we need to know is that I may develop a fever, I may develop some joint pains, I may develop some backache, I might even fail to wake up in the morning after receiving a jab. Mm. But within 24, 48 hours, 72 hours, I'm okay. And it has been documented. So we shouldn't get so worried about the side effects. And secondly, even a side effect is basically an indicator that the vaccine is working. Okay? okay. The okay. vaccine is working. Your body is now in the body. It's fighting. It's, it's already now <clears throat> producing the army to fight that virus in case you get in touch with it. So I'd like to encourage and even tell the viewers this evening that the COVID-19 vaccines are safe. We have those common, I use the word common side effects, okay. the fevers. Now, there are even rare side effects that are usually detected when we vaccinate millions and millions of people. All right. And rare it means basically one client can pop up out of the very many million doses that you've actually administered. But the question we ask ourselves, if that one case occurs, can it be managed? Can it be treated? Okay. If we can treat that case, then fine. That benefits outweigh the risks. What do we mean? 
that out of these 100 million people who have been vaccinated, one of them has reported this side effect, but the 999,000 are already protected against the disease. But even this one client, if she survives, will also be already protected against that disease. So I would like to encourage that vaccines are very safe. And the current vaccines used in this country have been approved by World Health Organization yeah. and endorsed by the National Drug Authority. Okay. But monitoring of all the side effects is ongoing. All the medical concerns, let me use the word medical concerns, not side effects, but if anyone has any medical concern, he or she should report immediately to the National Drug Authority so that okay. action can be taken. But beyond that, even seeking medical care is key. Many of us, when we develop these side effects, we stay at home. Self-medicate. Self-medicate. Then the thing gets worse, and then the following day, even the person passes on. But by the time we investigate, it was something else, but was linking this illness to the vaccine. Yet this person already had another <coughs> disease, or was already incubating something, and then it popped up. Okay. So that is what I'm saying. The vaccines are very safe. So, so one would ask, do all the vaccines brands work the same way? And it, is it safe? I take AstraZeneca today, no. the next dose I'll take Pfizer, and then when I want a boost, I'll say I'll take J&J. &J. <laughs> do they work the same way? And can I do this mix and match? Yes. Now, back still to history, March 2021, when we launched the vaccine, we're insisting, if you've started with AstraZeneca's dose one, continue using AstraZeneca's mm -hmm. dose two. But the scientists were not sleeping. They're working 24 seven. Because we have over 200 vaccines under the different phases of clinical trial. Okay. So far only 10 have been approved by WHO. But remember, we're supposed to vaccinate billions and billions of people. So the scientists went ahead to say, no, no, let us find out. Can I receive AstraZeneca? And then second dose, I receive Pfizer? And the answer is yes. The results have proved to be very good that you can mix. And now currently that the studies is AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson. If you receive dose one AstraZeneca, mm. you can receive your second dose as Pfizer or Moderna okay. to complete, to be fully vaccinated. If I receive Pfizer as my dose one or Moderna as my dose one, I can receive AstraZeneca as my dose two all even Johnson & Johnson to complete, to be fully vaccinated. Sinopharm and Sinovac. If I receive dose one or Sinopharm, dose uh, one, I can receive either AstraZeneca, all Johnson & Johnson, all Pfizer, all Moderna. So you see, studies have been done and it's have even been found to be, once you do that mix and match, yeah. if the immune response is much better than receiving the same vaccine. The side effects, because I know people raise an issue of the side effects. The side effects are similar to whether you receive AstraZeneca or whether you receive the Pfizer vaccine. So if any product is available when a client reports the vaccination center yeah. and the health worker tells you that I have this to enable you to complete, please just go ahead and accept whatever product is available because they all have the same result. Okay. Protecting us against dying and against rushing for oxygen. Mm -hmm. Remember during the third wave, we're all trying yes. to look around for oxygen cylinders yeah. because they all have the same end result. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Anit. Maybe I'd like to come back to Dr. Sabrina, just for clarity. When we said children and vaccination, mm -hmm. I am carrying my one month baby, that's a child. Mm -hmm. I have a 16 year old, that's a child. Mm -hmm. So do we have a particular age group that we are targeting of children who could be vaccinated? Or is it going to be throughout? As long as you drop on earth day one, you're a mm -hmm. child, you can be vaccinated. I, I like that. And it's, it's not true that um, the Ministry of Health and the government of Uganda is trying to vaccinate newborn babies. Okay. No, it's 12 years to 17 years. Oh, okay. And that is what has been recommended. However, I'd like to reassure the public and say that pregnant women are vaccinated and their babies in utero are safe. So that gives us confidence to know that even babies in utero, when the mom receives the vaccine, the, mom, the baby is safe. Okay. We know that recently the CDC in the U.S. has started to vaccinate children as young as two months. Wow. And there's a huge drive ongoing as we speak for children to get those 
safe and needed vaccines. Okay. Mm. Let me come to Dr. Atwine. When we talk about vaccines, we're talking about issues, medi uh, medicine or medical field. It is a service, but there is a business to it. And, and the president has also continuously, and that is why he continues to, to talk about scientists and they're going to solve our problems, uh, looking at the economic aspect of sciences. Now, the people who are saying, and, and this has come through, that one, you are, and, and when I say you, the medics, you're announcing webs because you want to cash in on that. You want to keep us um, vaccinating all the other time because there is someone who is cashing in on whichever vaccine is bought because this is manufactured. How could you help such a person? Because there is a truth to it, because there is someone who is catching in on whichever vaccine is sold, after all. For the manufacturers, yes, it is a business. But also it is answering a question, a global question, a health question. Mm. But for us as the sector, as the Ministry of Health and as government, it is about protection of lives because that is our cardinal mandate. Our cardinal mandate is to make sure that we, we educate, we provide all the information to the public, we provide the services, and yeah. one of those services is to make sure that we avail the vaccines, and, and, and also we go out and provide these services uh, to the people. So it, it has nothing to do with with the, the, the business on our side. Okay. Yes, it is true that some people think that um, <clears throat> when we say there is COVID and you know, that means that is money, but I, I, th I think our responsibility, it is about providing the right information, the accurate information, and we, pro we go ahead and provide the services that, we safeguard, that will safeguard the, 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 the lives of the people. Okay. So I just want to to assure the listeners that, that this is our mandate. So if we sat back and did nothing, then that will not be our, 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 our calling, our purpose, our goal, and objective as a sector. Okay. So that's why even we are seated here right now trying to provide this information to bring more reassurance to the public that government of Uganda, Ministry of Health, is committed together with partners to make sure that we provide the services that the people need and we provide all the information that the public needs. Thank you, Doctor. Let me come back to Dr. Kalebo here. Um, out of all the vaccines that we've so far gotten, I know that the parliament appropriated amounts of money for vaccine purchase. We waited until we could wait uh, no more. And then we started seeing donations come through. Um, number one, one would ask, why is Africa almost entirely depending on donations. And then there's been the whole discussion about these donations coming in towards expired debt. So it's more like they're dumping, the Western world is dumping to the African countries. I think COVID has given us a big lesson that Africa, we need to pull up. The reason we got donations, vaccines from elsewhere, because we didn't have the capacity to produce the vaccines. The disease was with us. We could not just look, so we had vac to get vaccines from elsewhere. And of course, the whole world was also looking, they prepared themselves that in case vaccines become available, how do they reach the low and middle income countries? COVAX was set up, oh. different uh, countries and different uh, uh, organizations to help resources, poor resources, so that the vaccines become available. So the main reason why we got vaccines from elsewhere because we didn't have them, we didn't have the capacity. It's only recently that some countries in Africa have started making some COVID vaccines, South Africa, uh, recently. So that was really a major, major, a major problem. And that has changed, is changing our thinking, how can we do better? Even here in Uganda, you hear the president and everyone urging how can Africa uh, do better? So that was really a major, major driving force the lack of uh, uh, the capacity. And as you saw, you're rightly say, said it, sometimes they were giving us even what is left, <laughs> leftovers, mm. yeah? leftovers. The vaccines started trickling in. COVAX nearly failed because even the vaccines you had, they tried to get AstraZeneca, then countries started 
buying everything for themselves. Mm. And when big pro pro uh, problem until afterwards and the don donations uh, started coming, on, coming in. So that was a major, major problem. But you talk about donations, yeah, uh, donations came in different ways, uh, uh, COVAX and other countries, but also the government, the PS will tell you, we are beginning to buy even using our, our own resources. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, it's a lesson. How can we develop capacity so that in the future, when we have these pandemics, Africa can also be at the forefront and uh, we are not left behind. All, all right, thank you very much. Let me get back to um, Professor Roda. You talked about the vaccine, its efficiency, and that we need to get a booster. And then someone is asking, are we going to boost up until Jesus returns? Every other six months, go for a booster. Every other six months, go for a booster. What, what is this? Um, so in terms of are we going to boost forever, uh, we are still uh, uh, following uh, research that's going on and also how the vaccine works uh, when we begin to use it, uh, following up people that um, have been vaccinated to see how long they can maintain that protection. And um, it's possible that we might need to eventually boost annually, that is possible because we know that for some vaccines that happens, like, like for influenza. But if it turns out that we can do longer, mm -hmm. uh, then that, that will really be good news. But the studies are still going on and um, we will have more evidence in terms of how long and how, how, how many more doses we need to have uh, uh, periodically to be able to keep us uh, protected. So, so that's a question that's really important and I hope that we, we will be able to know more soon. So yeah. we, we keep waiting um, uh, uh, for the um, research that is coming out. But also Absolutely. part of the information that has clearly come out is, uh, out of those admissions that we've had, even people have gone up to the extent of uh, ICU, um, a, a section, and quite a big section of them, had been vaccinated already, either just one dose or even double doses. And one would ask, do the vaccines really work now? If I am saying, um, the medics are saying, vaccinate and then protect yourself against adverse effects. And then I'm having an admission and the people going to ICU even after they've been vaccinated. That changes the whole perception about um, the efficacy of these vaccines. Um, it shouldn't necessarily change it because basically um, the, the vaccine moderates the severity of the disease. So we may have a few people end up in ICU, but they could actually have been more. Now, um, especially when we get newer variants uh, of the disease, as we've discussed earlier, some of them might be able to evade the protection that we've got from the vaccines and you still get COVID, but at least it's moderated. The, the evidence shows that the, you know, the severity of the disease is still moderated and it's not as, as, as bad as it ought to have been. Now, what we see is that some of these newer variants spread faster. They are more transmissible. So you might end up with a much bigger population of people getting that disease. And because of that, you see as if there are more people being hospitalized, not because it's not working, okay. but because you have a big number of people infected. For example, if you had a thousand people infected and, and, and maybe five percent might end up going to hospital, you will end up with 50 people, right? Uh, 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 being, you know, ending up in the hospital. But what would happen if, on the other hand, you had a hundred thousand people infected? Mm. So you might see, oh, all of a sudden we have 500 people in the hospital and that means the vaccines are not working. No, they are actually still working, but we just have a huge number of people that are infected. And how do we deal with that? Get more people vaccinated so that even when we have more people infected, uh, if they are not able to use other protective means, at least we moderate the proportion of people that will end up with severe disease. So yes, it does work and it still remains one of the most critical tools that's going to help us so that we can get back to work okay. and, and maintain our livelihood. All right, thank you very much. In relation to the same, Dr. Sabrina, there have been reports of vaccinated children dying more than unvaccinated. How true could those reports be? And is there any connection to the reality that when I vaccinate my child, because the parents then would get worried, I, I risk losing them maybe? Uh, and I'll, I'll let you know that I am a member of the COVAX facility committee 
and which means I read a lot of literature and data regarding the vaccines and how they are working, not only here in Uganda, but globally. And the question you asked is actually not true. It's not true that more children who are vaccinated are dying, because that literature is not there. Okay. So maybe it's, one of the, it's maybe one of the hoaxes and misinformation that are geared towards discouraging people from getting the vaccine. Mm. Mildred, the truth is um, when a dog bites a man, that's not news. <laughs> but when a man bites a dog, that is big news. Yes. And the people who are scaremongers, they deal with man bite dog kind of news. Mm which sometimes is ridiculous and it needs to be checked. And we are here to check that information. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and in relation just to the children, let me get to um, Dr. Annette. And I think you can break it down a little bit. Myocarditis in children, those have been reports that are particularly coming in. And how true are they? How can uh, someone be able to break down or decipher that sort of information? Okay, thank you very much. Now, when the Pfizer vaccine, so Pfizer is the only vaccine approved to be administered to children sure. five years and above, and then 12 to 17 is both Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Now, as many more children were being vaccinated, there's been an observation in a slight increase in the number of children who develop that myocarditis. It's basically some uh, we call it an inflammation of the heart, heart mm -hmm. muscles. But the good news, it is a very mild disease. The other good news is self-limiting. The other good news, of every 100 children who may develop that disease, 99.9% .9 improve. And the other good news, it is very, very rare. Can I repeat that? It is a very rare occurrence following vaccination. Okay. Now let us go back to the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself. Many of us who got infected with that virus did not have any heart disease. And I, and I can believe people who are listening to us this evening. But the moment they got that virus, they started manifesting some heart problems. Mm. And for every 100,000 clients who develop the COVID-19 disease, mm. 4,000 4, of them developed the heart problem. And now they even continue to on medication. Mm. But for the vaccine, as long as the mother brings that child early enough, immediately to the hospital. <clears throat> and what do we mean? If this child develops the following cardinal symptoms, eh? slight pain around the heart, previously did not have it, post-vaccination. Mm. Slight increase in the heartbeat, slight difficulty in breathing, the mother or the caretaker should not remain at home. They should report immediately to the health facility, to the hospital, so that immediate treatment is provided to this child. All right, maybe, Dr. Annette, just before you continue, like you said, yes, there is a lot of good news that you talked about, but you know many a times we want to say, yes. what if, for that small uh, percentage, that could be able to get the inflammatory cardiomyopathy that you talked about? What could be the cause? Is it that the child has an underlying issue, or what exactly could lead to it? Okay. Now, the studies are still ongoing. There are still assumptions. Is it a genetic component? Mm -hmm. Because there's still a new manifestation which has come out as we are rolling out the vaccines. So studies are still ongoing to tell us the actual cause, what could be the actual cause of this myocarditis, pericarditis, mm. which is occurring post-vaccination. Thoughts could be a genetic component. Secondly, is it an immune response following the vaccine, not necessarily the components of the vaccine, so until we get that information, because the science is still ongoing, research is still ongoing, we will yeah. come back and tell the community that this is the likely cause 
of this myocarditis or pericarditis. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, this discussion is still on, and uh, just a disclaimer, uh, when we talk medical terms, I would still ask them to break it down because not everyone who is listening <laughs> is a medic or understands this uh, medical language. But sometimes, yes, that it, it, it becomes hard for doctors to break down their you know, words, medical terminologies into layman's language, but we're trying as much as possible. Some of your questions and responses are coming in, and we promise to be able to pay attention to them. So let me hand you over to my colleague, uh, Ben Winne, to take us through part of the discussions that are coming through. Ben, you're smiling. I'm wondering what sort of conversations are there online. No, actually, I'm just picking up on what you said about knowledge of medical things, because you say the word that I cannot pronounce, <laughs> schedule something, myopa something. I, it's okay, don't worry. I, I wouldn't even try doing <laughs> I'm a that. nurse's daughter, so don't worry. Oh, obviously. But of course, again, we are not scientists uh, for most yeah. of us, and we depend on the experts to give us the answers to the questions. And that's why we are here to try and get those answers for you, of course, as we talk about um, COVID vaccination um, protecting you and your child. And we're saying say yes to vaccination, but of course also giving you an opportunity to ask any questions, which is why we're coming to you live from here at NBS 13 Summit View in Naguru, live on Urban TV, on Baba TV, and on Booker Day as well. And giving you an opportunity, especially on Twitter, for those of you who are on social media, to ask any questions that you might have and make sure that we get answers for them. The hashtags for you to use, vaccines work, COVID vaccination UG as well, you can be able to use those and the questions will be coming to you. And we have lots of questions coming through, including one that is specifically for you, Professor Kadebo, because apparently the person says that you're a man, therefore they trust that you won't lie, as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know what this question is about. Yeah. Does COVID affect machines working? If you know, you know. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to Professor Kadebo to tell us yeah. if, if, if the systems are still working on his side. Oh. Uh, I can tell you mine are. Um, this is someone coming saying that, uh, and, and I think it was asked by one of the panelists, we are hearing about the misinformers. We have a lot of misinformation coming out. Yeah. And for Dr. Atwine, what is the Ministry of Health going to do about these categories of misinformers and influencers who are putting a lot of people at risk by telling a lot of lies? We have questions. Uh, Leonard is asking about the short, short shelf life of vaccines and what that's all about and if it affects the you know people being a bit hesitant to use the vaccines. Um, someone is, is Cabrin. She's asking. We've been told about mutations, and I think Dr. Sabrina touched on this. Um, what do we? What assurance do we have that the vaccines will be able to uh, work against many mutations that come? Michael Tsaremwa is asking. He's been vaccinated. He wants to know how come Africans have not been dying um, a, a lot, and especially in the villages. And how many boosters is one going to need to be safe? Um, this is coming in from you, Matthew Kagaula, and he says he wants to know, does nutrition have anything to do with whether a vaccine will work or not? We have a lot more questions coming uh, through. We'll pass them on to our panelists, and Mildred will put them before them. And if you have any more that haven't been asked yet, feel free to get in touch, of course, via Twitter. And of course, we'll pass those on to our panelists. We'll take a very short break. We'll co come back in just a bit and pick up on this discussion. The reminder for you, we're saying, say yes to vaccines. COVID-19 vaccination protects you and your children. Our hashtags to use, vaccines work. COVID vaccination UG, we will be right back. Under the Pearl of Africa, a land with the world's most beautiful, captivating features, hills, mountains, and valleys, the enigmatic animal species in the wild. A land where Africa is condensed into one small country with authentic endowment of nature and perfect safari. Uganda, the Pearl of Africa is without the crowds with abundant primates, wildlife and stunning scenery. Uganda, 
the pearl of Africa, takes you beyond the guidebooks, the known features and gives you the insights unmatched. Keep it UBC TV, where we inspire Uganda with the authentic beauty and nature of our motherland. Uganda, the pearl of Africa. Discover the fountain. Man, what's a weekend without entertainment? To be boring, right? It would be a weekend without a vibe. There has to be a vibe. And and, and what better vibe then? Horizon right, vibe. Hey, let's go! Everybody, let's go! Everybody, let's go! Come on now, give it to me! Hey! True story, man. From the crew to the vibers, we bring you nothing but good vibes. From celebrity interviews. The song because I did with Shina Skies, I mean, that was a prayer to me. Video premieres. Turn up sessions. And if you're making a fight, I saw me to look. Exclusives and so much.